हेलो फ्रेंड्स सुमित दिसाई सो एज पार्ट ऑफ द डेटा इंजीनियर्स क्लब हियर कम्स द फर्स्ट मॉक इंटरव्यू एंड इट्स टेकन बाय एन इंडस्ट्री एक्सपर्ट अंकुर हु हैज अराउंड नाइन इयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस विद मोर देन फाइव इयर्स इन डेटा इंजीनियरिंग he knows a lot of stuff he is an excellent mentor too right so he would be conducting the interview and the one who would be attending the interview is pradu who has around 3 years of experience in data engineering mainly on technologies like pyspark databricks and more towards azure cloud right so pradu is a very skilled person he tries to work on challenging projects and he is ready to face the interview by the way before we start i would like to tell you that both of these persons ankur and prarup are trying to help the community out so do not try to judge them in any means right this video is purely for learning purpose and you should take the positives out of it rather than thinking about negatives and i would urge all of you to come forward and try helping the community out in case if you want to make a great difference in the society do not forget to like the video and make sure to subscribe to the channel hit the bell icon so that you do not miss on any interesting stuff so with this let's start with the video hey hi prarup how are you hi i'm good i am good how are you yeah i'm fine uh, okay thanks for joining the session today uh, okay I just wanted to know a bit about yourself, your total experience, and uh, what kind of technology you are currently working in, specifically the data engineering, and uh, your day-to-day -day jobs, etc. So we can start. Yeah, sure. So first of all, it's my pleasure to introduce myself here. My name is Prarup Sachedi. So after completed my graduation in 2021, it's been close to three years of experience in data engineering. Currently, I am working in Sigma Analytics as a data engineer. my current roles and responsibilities daily includes first of all the major role i am focusing on is ingesting of data using the azure data factory so where we have various sources like http connector azure sql server azure sql db on premise these are the various sources and i think is one and only one that is adls gen2 azure data lake storage gen2 so using the adf copy command pipeline building and data flow activities we are able to ingest the data so that in the aid from adls gen2 we can take over that data and do that pre processing part using pyspark or databricks as per the business requirements and uh, but the main thing here is we are along with writing the pyspark queries or databricks queries we are focusing on optimizations ankur because that is the backbone of any data engineering project which helps in very much resource utilization and along with the uh, processing of the data flow as efficient as possible so that uh, data analyst or data scientist team can make a good use of it in terms of uh, in terms of oltp while they are querying the data so that can get fast results or uh, data scientist for machine learning algorithms building and all so that is my day to day and that's all about me okay so uh, you said that you are processing the data with the databricks price uh, for job so my question would be once you are done with the processing uh, what is the sync for your pipeline where you are storing that data yeah so here comes the scenario like say the business scenario includes uh, we want to give give this data for the data scientist to apply the machine learning algorithms on that so in that case what we do is we make a resultant container inside our adls gen2 and inside the resultant container we just put that parquet or csv whatever format file we have we just put that structured data into that resultant container but in case the requirement is that is used to be used by data analyst team for the visualization purpose they have to query as fast as possible like say we have the amazon data like say any flipkart amazon and some sales is going on and data analyst want to analyze that how much sales is happened for the few past two hours they want a quick results right in that case adls gen2 csv parquet file that won't work okay parquet file is a good but it won't work as effective as the rdbms will work so in that case what i will do is first i will keep it in the adls gen2 and from adls gen2 using adf i will copy in azure sql server or something so that from there they can use the efficient make of query run fast 
the other three so uh, okay so you have put put that again of your data from your ready list into to the azure sql server yeah but uh, any kind of uh, any kind of data warehouse uh, is present in your project like uh, where you can model your data any kind of you are creating are you, are you involved in creating the fact or dimension things any kind of schema something like that in your project yeah actually we are using the help of azure synapse analytics mostly the uh, yeah. not the we are not using the dedicated sql pool we are just using the serverless pool that is mm -hmm. much more than warehouse only oh, okay that is warehouse okay. so what we are doing is we are making that external table and that is pointing to that location of our adls gen 2 and using that we are st okay. storing our data in azure sql okay. okay so uh, what what amount of data you are building in your day two and day pipeline? Uh, tell me the amount of data you are building. Yeah, so amount of data like weekly, if I tell you, it's in the range of 65 to 80 GB of data weekly. So mm -hmm. per day, we can say it's 16 to 20 GB of data we are uh, uh, ingesting per day. These are scheduled jobs or these are on demand jobs? These are scheduled jobs and basically most of the times, uh, rarely we are using the event-based trigger, but we are using the scheduling trigger uh, every 24 hours. So that in, in, in the meantime, when we have switched off our system, our cluster is still running and those jobs will run every 24 hours. Okay. So talking about the trigger, let's discuss uh, what are the different kinds of trigger um, in ADS present? Yeah, so we have various kind of trigger, like we have scheduling trigger, then apart from that, we have event-based trigger, and then we have tumbling window trigger. Mm -hmm. These are the various kind of triggers present in ADL. What do you understand by the tumbling window? Tumbling window, what, uh, although I haven't used in, in my real life as of now, but what mm -hmm. my understanding says is, it's mm -hmm. almost equivalent to what we can say as a scheduling event trigger only. But we, what happens in, in scheduling the event trigger, what happens is we can make only, we, we can't make uh, like what we can say, we can't capture it, these triggers in a series. Like let's say we do one partition in one go, then remaining something in other go. We can't put a series of steps here. But in tumbling window, we can put a series of step by doing small, small works there. So it's the advanced version of what I believe is that scheduled event tree. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what do you understand by the incremental load? Incremental load, yeah. So uh, and uh, how it has been, how you can implement uh, through the data factory, like the data factory. Yeah, sure. So what I understood Uncle, by incremental load is, let's say we are working on some project, maybe insurance or retail. Let's say retail as an example. So let's say we have a data of customers, orders, or we have suppliers. So what happens is these suppliers data, these customers data, these are mostly the background data and most of the time it won't change frequently. But mm -hmm. coming to the orders data, that is basically the fact table, right? And we, we put it in the fact table in terms of dimensional modeling. That is the table which has so many records and it keeps on fluctuating. Let's say today one customer is coming, although he's already a customer in Amazon or Flipkart, but he, today he might purchase 10 orders. Other day he might purchase some other order so that orders data will keep on getting the much more records. So in mm -hmm. that way, we need while we are ingesting it from our source, let's say our source is Amazon S3 uh, mm -hmm. or something, and we want to ingest in ADLS Gen 2. So what happens is if we uh, incrementally, if we can't load it in incremental fashion, what we have to do is we have to scan the data completely. Like every day we have to scan all the data and load. So what that happens is it will take a lot of time and also put the load on the ADA, ADF, all the resources we put and all. So mm -hmm. what so that makes a necessity for the incremental load. And in that case, what I prefer to do is that we can use much absurd, like let's say I am making the ingestion from Amazon S3 to our ADLS Gen 2. So in the ADLS Gen 2, uh, so first of all, I have to connect my ADF with uh, using the link service with Amazon S3 as a source. And I will also connect it using my Databricks cluster so that 
there i will write the logic of merge absurd so in merge absurd what will happen is i will make sure that in case the record is new so we have to insert and in case the record is already existing just we have some updates on that we can just update that record so i will make use of that merge absurd understand uh, <clears throat> what is the basic difference uh, we have in data lake data warehouse uh, what kind of difference we have yeah yeah so what happens is as we data lake we have uh, example of adls gen 2 so mm -hmm. here what happens is we can put any form of data like structured semi structured unstructured mm -hmm. like we have video files audio files or csv json any kind of data we can put so what happens is we are basically using the use of uh, elt so that we can extract load and we can do, do the transformation afterwards also using PySpark or data. But coming to data warehouse, what happens is data warehouse is mostly used for the reporting or Power BI purposes so that the data analyst team can do some reporting and analysis. So here we can't put the unstructured data, raw data kind of things. First of all, we have to transform the data based on the certain schema, whatever the mm -hmm. schema the business requirement wants and then only we can load the data. So it uh, puts the completely structured data only, like the database only. But the main difference, again, between database and data warehouse is database mm -hmm. is basically used for OLTP, we know, like online transactional mm -hmm. processing, so that we can query it faster. But data warehouse is mostly used for OLAP, online analytical processing, so that we can make mm -hmm. use of Power BI or visualizations for the reporting team and the data analyst to make some histogram bar chart out of there so that they can provide it to the data scientist team for their uh, machine learning algorithm. Yeah, so makes sense. Uh, talking about data warehouse, uh, you should be knowing that uh, there is a specific type of storage fashion called as column storage. storage. It yeah. is used in heavy links mostly in the data warehouse uh why it has used in data warehouse and what do you what do you understand by column storage so yeah, yeah so what <clears throat> i understand by columnar storage is let's say we are putting let, let's take an example of csv file that is not columnar that is a row based storage so there we are putting the file what we are doing is uh, we are putting the records just row by row whenever we are getting new records we are just uh, making it in the new line and inserting in that so in that fashion, what is happening is it makes our write uh, faster because it's uh, nothing we has, it has to do. It just has to put the record in the next line. But while we are reading that record from the some file or something using the data frame, it, it will make the time very, very much because uh, what happens is it has to scan complete. Let's say we have one TB of data and, just, and we have, let's say, uh, 220 columns, let's say. But just we want to read, let's say, 10 columns. So in row-based format, even if we have to read just a subset of columns, it has to pass the complete data in order to read. But what happens is columnar-based is it uh, put the data in terms of columns. Every column is coming in a one sequence. So the main use of this is, okay, while writing, it has to make a, a use of this. Yeah, okay, first I have to put that column there, that value there, that value there, because but while reading it is very, very effective because if we make a use of subset of columns, it won't have to scan that to 20 columns. Just mm -hmm. those subset of columns, it will scan and it can make a effective use of that. So the main okay. advantage of a columnar based file for me is yes. Okay. Uh, you were saying that uh, you involve of optimizations of your price per job uh, in Databricks. So I in, wanted to know that what kind of challenges or bottleneck you faced in the time of creating the data pipeline and how you have resolved that, what kind of strategy you have taken to optimize your pipeline. Yeah, sure. Like uh, as I started my journey in 2021, at the first instance, uh, it was not the very hard kind of problem statement user stories are given to me. So mm -hmm. I don't face uh, that much huge challenge, but small, small things at that time was a challenge for me. So the first challenge what I faced during the pipeline building was 
like whenever I am running that pipeline, right? I can't able to parameterize it. So I have to give those, I have to make so many link services uh, at a go and I have to make so many data sets and all. And that will mm -hmm. make all those pipelines not the proper serialized. And we have to make so many resources and that create a bulk on those uh, that complete ADF pipeline. So first of all, I understood that instead of making use of different, different resources, try to make it in a parameterized way so that we can give a parameter parameter at the pipeline level we can say even we can give inside also like some activity copy activity mm -hmm. level it will flow from pipeline to inside activity to that inside activity so first of all the main thing i realized is para para parameterizing is a very important ro role in the data pipeline that adf pipeline and mm -hmm. apart from that the other issue i faced as i am uh, refreshing my mind is like uh, yeah yeah that, that thing uh, what happens is while I am ingesting data from source right most of the time if the data is very huge and if they are ingesting the complete data without knowing the business scenario it will mm -hmm. take a lot a lot of time even if we schedule so that is a background activity job if we want then we can do but if we don't have the proper resource and we want it to happen at the interactive mode only at that time only at that instance it will take a lot of time so what happens is at that time we make sure that from the business team we have a proper understanding that what they want from this all data they want exact data only or they want a proportion of data so that at the source level only we can filter those out and then only we can ingest the small portion of data as for the business team. So these two are the most important challenges in ADF. If I talk any about data, any data bricks related optimization you have done, any PySpark optimization you have done. Yeah. So in terms of PySpark optimization, like initially, although I'm not doing the optimization part, as I say, it's very easy. But at that time also, I get to know, like uh, we have to do the predicate push down using filters. As soon as we apply the filters, it is very much good for the data processing so that it won't have to scan the complete data. So we have to, we have to use the where clause as soon as possible. Then we can do other things. That's the sub, 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 most simple optimization we can say. And apart from that, uh, as my uh, roles and responsibilities increases, as the demand of the project increases, I get to know that there are various uh, things. What happens is, let's say we are getting some data, like let's say, again, we talk about the radials only, where we have the order ID, order amount, and order status and all. Sometimes what happens is there is one column, which uh, in, in that one column, that particular value is repeating most of the times. What happens is, so when we are in, 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 implementing that Spark, uh, job, once that job runs, what happens is that skewness will come into picture, that all those uh, uh, partitions will go into that one uh, cluster only. So that is that is a very, very uh, cumbersome process because what happens in that kind of thing is uh, uh, it, it will take only one task is taking a lot of time and let's say we have nine partitions. So let's say eight partitions are of uh, not that much uh, high, uh, but one partition is taking more and more uh, so what is happening is that eight partitions can uh, complete their work in 10 to 15 seconds, but that remaining mm -hmm. one partition will take the whole load of time and it will might take five to 10 minutes also. And it, so it will take a load in terms of computation also and resources also. So what we can do in that kind of scenario is initially I know the concept of salting. We haven't applied it's mm -hmm. the initial, but now the cloud version came. So what we do is if we are using the Spark 3.2 version, we don't have okay. to do anything because we have the AQE enabled directly. But if mm -hmm. we are using the Spark 3.0 or less version, because as we are using Spark 3.0 only, mm -hmm. so there we have to make the AQE enabled because by default it is, it is disabled mm -hmm. so that it can make use of that uh, uh, SQ partitions and it, it won't affect that uh, so much of the computation and all. And apart from that, uh, I also got a scenario as I am working on the retails project, right? So I got a scenario. We have the customer's data, which is very, very small, even less than we can say 10 MB. But the orders data, as I can say, it is the incremental data. It keeps on increasing. Okay, like mm -hmm. customer data, like we have, let's say, 100 customers. But those 100 customers, let's say, are placing on average 10 orders each. And inside that also, in that 10 orders, we have some order items and all. So what will happen is in that case, if we just join it by inner join or left outer join or something, what will happen is 
shuffling have to take place for joining as join is a wide uh, transformation right so mm -hmm. what happens is in that case of shuffling the mm -hmm. all the nodes the data has to be uh, relocated to different different nodes and that is a very very cumbersome process that will take a lot of time there so what we can do there is instead of using the inner or that join to avoid shuffling as much as possible we can make use of the broadcast join so we have done okay. that also optimization what these are the high level optimization Ankur. even i had done some small level also like one time i am doing some uh, grouping and pivoting of the table right you know no? pivoting we can mm -hmm. for getting the better results better view so what i saw in one time while we are doing the pivoting of the data right I saw if, if I'm not uh, making the list of the columns and I put inside that pivot function, it has to scan the complete data and saw what all are the different, different columns are there. But in case if I put those column different partitions in that, uh, uh, that, that pivot function, it won't have to scan the complete data. It will trust on our, those things and can directly make utilization of those and that will reduce very, very uh, much time. Those are yeah. the side. You, you talked about the broadcast join. What exactly happened when you broadcast a table? Yeah. So what happens is, uh, let's say we have two tables, let's say orders and customers. And one table is uh, large, uh, let's say of one TB or maybe two TB data. And the other table customers is uh, very, very small in comparison to that, maybe less than 10 MB, let's say 8 MB. So what happens is, in case, let's say I am doing the inner join, let's so what will happen is, let's say I am joining it based on, uh, let's say customer ID, that is the primary key for the customer table and foreign key for the other table. So okay. what will happen is, let's say we have the customer ID 101, 102, 103, let's say after uh, the partitioning is done for one TB. So as we know, for one TB data, we have in one TB, we have almost 1000 GB. And uh, so uh, around 8000 partitions will be created. So there is a chance that these in these partitions as data is random. It is not in a sequential manner. So mm -hmm. like a 101 customer ID may go to partition number one also, three also, five also on different different partition. So in order for that to join the all their customers ID from the customer table also, their shuffling needs to be done. That all the 101 will come on one partition, 102 will come on another partition. So that it makes the effective use of join. But here, what happens is as shuffling is a wide partition and it will take a lot and lot of time, plus the 200 uh, new new shuffle partitions will also get created. So it is a very uh, cumbersome process. It will take a lot and lot of time plus resource utilization also. So mm -hmm. in terms of broadcast join, what we can do is we can allocate that customer's uh, database, right? That customer's table to a driver. Driver will keep it as a very small table. So it doesn't make much difference. Now driver will broadcast it to all the partitions. Let, let, let's say in the partition one, we have some tables of data of orders in partition two something and all. Mm -hmm. So the customer's data is also broadcasted on all the partitions. And now what will happen is if we want to join any of the customer ID, let's say 101, it don't have to do a shuffling because all those customers ID are just, it just has to map and without any shuffle operation, it can able to perform in a very effective way. Uh... So now we'll be moving to some coding questions. Most we have discussed on our theoretical part. Yeah. Uh, instead of the, yeah. yeah. So you can start the coding question. Yeah. Sure. Way to obtain Instagram feeds to be fall into that. Okay. Data is coming. This is So we have this table. Apart from that, this thing. So I am good. Like I have one doubt here. Mm -hmm. Like what I am the understanding is like they are saying okay we have to filter is based on the two two thousand twenty two records that's not a problem but like they are asking to obtain the histogram of tweets posted per user so is the is this like uh, we have to find the count of uh, users who are posting the tweets in twenty twenty two or uh, what I am understanding from is histogram of tweets posted per user okay let me let, give me a one second check the output. Check the example out. 
So there will be two buckets, okay? Mm -hmm. Basically, if you see, two kinds of tweet happened in 2022. So, there is an user ID okay. that is triple one. Yeah. Who made two tweets in 2022. So, that is one bucket. Oh, I get to know. Okay, so by that you mean to say like, let's say user ID 111 has made two tweets in 2022. So we have to make the count of how many persons make two tweets or how many one like those things, right? Yes. Okay. So that is the first tweet bucket. In the second tweet bucket, if you see, there is only one user. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So I understood that means tweet bucket indicates like, let's say that one user has made the two tweets and the two users has made one tweet. That is the meaning of this output, right? Hmm. So like tweet bucket represent the number of users who make tweets and users num represent how many tweets not, they made, right? Yes. Yeah, so basically do not, uh, tweet bucket is basically, uh, it's a, just like a row number thing, okay? So uh -huh. there is a, uh, it's a sequence of how many different incident happen in terms of making a tweet, okay? So if you see the table in 2022, there are user ID triple one, he made two tweets and another tweet, another user ID that is 20 to 254. He made a single tweet. Yeah. So that comes in the tweet bucket. Oh, understood, understood. Yeah, got it. Okay. So for solving this, uh, I think uh, first of all, we need to make use of, uh, we have to group it by, I think, based on user ID and we have to find the count of tweets each user ID is making, right? I, let let me try. I think from that table only we can derive this solution. Let me try. Yeah. So basically, what we have to do here is <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So let me make use of CTA. Yeah. Right. That will make it easy, very much easy for me. Okay. So with let me give the name as, as I am using the count here of all the tweets that each user has made. Let, let's say total tweets. I'm giving this as a name. Yeah. The name and as. Yeah. So this is what I'm making the city and uh, I'm giving the name as total tweets. Okay. So here, let me select the relevant columns as I am grouping it on based on user ID. That's the name, yeah, user underscore ID. And I am doing a count. And what count I am doing? I am doing a count based on so how many tweets a user has made. Yeah. And let's, let's say I, I will give it the column name as. What's the table name? Tweets. Okay. So we have to do only for 2022, right? Yeah, you check the uh, in below example output. There is an explanation. Oh yeah. Of this output, just go down. Yeah. Yeah, check that explanation. Oh, based yeah. on the example output. I think. So based on the read it out, you will understand. Yeah, there are two users who posted only one tweet in 2022. Okay, yeah. So that is simple. We have to filter just for 2022 and one user who posted two tweets in 2022. Oh, okay, yeah. Same. So like uh, uh, how many users posted, uh, how many tweets? That's the major out. You yeah. have to distinguish different user ID who makes the number of tweets in 2022. Yeah. Based on that, you will do it. 
Yeah. Okay, let me filter it out where the column is tweet date. Yeah. Okay. Column name should be tweet bucket, the first column, the second column is the user underscore number. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's the, that is the output. Yeah, I understand. But first, I'm trying to make use of the CT and driving some other table because I don't feel from this table we can derive directly to this solution. So what I'm doing is okay. So we are tweet date. Let's say as we want only the year 2022, right? So we can give the date between let's say 2022 from we can say January and till 31st December. <laughs> So this is the filtering condition we use that that will only take the records for 2022, right? But as we are doing the count of tweet ID, so we have to group it by based on the user ID because for all the users, how many tweets they do, we are doing that, right? So let me group it by based on user underscore ID. So I don't know what this will give is this will give me like a, let's say user one 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 has done three tweets and user two five four has done just one tweet. So how many tweets the user has done? But here the year is just one twenty two as I am filtering. So user one two tweets will come and for user two that user one 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 two tweets will come. User two fifty four one tweet will come and user one forty eight one tweet will come. So it will give me a number of tweets per user in year twenty twenty two, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to derive the tweet bucket and use them as okay. Now I believe from here we can try to derive that solution. Okay. Now what we can do is we can select uh, as we are giving given right uh, tweet count per user, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can make use of that as a tweet bucket, a tweet bucket. So like tweet, let me copy this so that it will. count per user and what the column name as tweet bucket. This will serve as a tweet bucket, right? Mm -hmm. So what information this is giving is like uh, how many users are making uh, the tweets like as you said, it's working as a row number, right? Mm -hmm. So I can make use of this and uh, apart from that, if I want to get like how many users are make one tweet and how many users make two tweets. So for that, we can use the uh, again the count function on the user ID. So we can count it based on user ID. This will give me a count of, let's say for oh, how many users has make a tweet, let's say for intuitive user bucket, let's say we got one. So how many users has made one tweet? So that will count here, right? So I can make use of this and I can give as users, let's say we can give users number, like this account, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we are making a select of all those two columns from that are derived table, that temporary CT. So that is basically total tweets from total. But again, we have to here group it by, right? Because as we are using the aggregation function, so we have to group it by based on this tweet bucket only, right? Group by. Now what it will do is what I believe is so let's say here from here from our CT we derived the users uh, tweet uh, like let's say for particular user how many tweets they did in 2022 right so here we are making use of that whatever we have done tweet count per user as a tweet bucket so let's say in the first uh, CT what is happen is this ID 111 will give us two okay this ID 254 will give us one and 148 will give us one. Now we need to find out like that, uh, how, what, what is the meaning of this is, let's say tweet bucket one. So how many users make two uh, tweets? How many users make only one tweet? So from here we can see, right? 111 has made two tweets. So how many users have made two tweets? One user. So that is defined the tweet bucket from my understanding. And how many users have made just one tweet and that is, uh, 254 and 148. So two users have made just one tweet. 
So that will serve as a purpose of tweet bucket. And we are use, using the count of user ID from this and grouping it by this. This will give us the correct result, I believe. Yeah, executor query answer. Just yeah. click on the run code. Yeah, sure. Okay, not some return. Yeah. Okay, this is giving some syntax error, I believe. There is a minor syntax error in here. Yeah. Just check it. Yeah, I'm trying. <clears throat> One. Check the error. Whatever the error you are getting is written over the syntax. Oh, understood. Sorry, sorry. I have given the spelling wrong. Yeah. You 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 check the you check the syntax error whatever you are getting. What is it? Syntax error at near past, right? Yeah. <clears throat> oh gosh, okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is giving yeah. exit. Yeah, uh, we have done a nice job here. And uh, let's move on the another question. I'll give you a ice bar question, a coding yes, question. Sir. Yes, sir. Easy one only. Yeah. Let's see. You can you can stop you can stop sharing this. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I'm sending you a table in chat. I tried to stop sharing. It is not stopping. I don't know. Okay, it's okay. Oops. Okay. Yeah, I sent you a table. Just open that in chat. Give me an option. I am not getting the option of going. It's like in the above tab, there is one window coming. It is not letting me to go inside the chat. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, now I can able to see. Sorry for that. Yeah. Okay. So this is a table. Yeah. Uh, there is two col three columns, name, reference ID, and salary. Yeah. Okay. Uh the first column is Mahesh. I mean the name. And then there will be a reference ID. Yeah. And then that is a salary. So how the reference ID is uh, has been printed there. It is like this only. So, so it's div. Then after that, that is location. That is location ID. Okay. So I want my output table like this. Uh, like this. So there will be name, then reference ID, then salary. And the location. So location, if you see, location is the middle one after the first hyphen. Yeah. What is there? That is a location. So you have to take out from there, and you have to make a another column as location. That to put. So the example column would be for the first row, Mahesh div hyphen chn underscore five six zero three. Then CHN as location. Understood? Okay, so that means uh, what uh, I can understand from here is this uh, reference ID is a combination of three things, div, location, and ID. 
So from there, we need to separate it out differently. Like we have to give the reference ID as different thing. And in location, what uh, you suggested, could you please explain again? Location is, location is nothing but the middle word. D, after DIV, there is CHN. So CHN is the location. Okay. If if you see the second root, Pala, D, D, I, V, H, Y, D, yeah. Then after that, that is location ID, and after that, that is his salary. So Understood. here, location is HYD. Understood. Understood. And when you will separate out that location and create a new column, then you have to use this logic, and you have to rename that location column. So if you find CHN, so that yeah. is the next step. Okay. So you first do the first one. When you are ready with the first one, then you have to modify your data frame, rename your location column. If it is CHN, rename it as Chennai. If it is HYD, rename it as Hyderabad. So your output schema will be named reference ID, salary, and location. First, you will split it out that HYD and whatever the location. And then you have to rename that location based on that logic. Understood? Yeah, understood. I am making you, I'm making you the co-host again. And yeah. you can share your screen. And we yeah. can start solving it. Yes. So is my screen visible? Yes. Just open a notepad. Yeah. And start. Just let me copy this thing so that I can get a good view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will put it in my notepad. It shouldn't take uh, more than five to seven minutes, I believe. Yeah. So, So Hango, like from here, what I can understand is first of all we have to read this data frame, whatever data you, we have. You do not have to. We do not have to read the data frame. Uh, just uh, assume that you have a data frame called employee DF. Okay. Okay. So employee DF has this three column: name, reference ID, and salary. And then you can start doing the data frame manipulation from that point. Nice. So what I am understanding from here is, first of all, this reference ID, we have to separate it in terms of uh, three different, like uh, uh, one is this uh, div, then one is location, and one is that ID as you have given, name, reference ID, and location, right? Div, location, and ID. So for separating one column, what I, I am understanding is we can make use of the either the split function or we have some regex replace function also in PySpark, I believe. So whatever you feel comfortable, you can do. Okay. okay. So. Let's say I have imported the split function from PySpark or SQL dot function. That, that, is, that is fine. That is fine. Okay. So from this, I can use make of that split function and I am splitting what? This employee DF. of the particular column and particular column is a reference in this code ID. So this is can the particular you, column. Can you use split function directly in that group? Yeah. <clears throat> can you use split function in that way? Will that give you any syntax error? Or that is fine. Uh, I think we can apply sorry I can, we can apply it on data frame. One directly here. Yeah. Okay. Employee, I can give it a rename. Modified. Yeah. We can use. And now what we are doing is we are splitting it based on certain things, right? Mm -hmm. So let me first split it based on. Or we can use inside. Let's see. I'm selecting this particular column. Split off. Yeah. 
Okay. And now I am splitting is it based on first of all we have uh, this uh, underscore and one is this uh, dash. Yeah. So let's say I am first of all splitting is based on this. Yeah. So what this will give me is this will give, give me that div will come separately and uh, okay. And this. Uh, CHN underscore five six zero six three will come separately, right? Mm -hmm. So there, from here we will get two columns. But yes. for the just, I wanted to know this is in the CSV file, right? So it is in the form of column commas, right? Comma separated, right? Yeah, it's CSV. Yes. Yeah. So for this particular column, I will split it based on this. But I think here we need to do two level of splitting, right? Because first we have to split it based on this uh, div dash ch and then on base of underscore. Two level of splitting will come into picture. Correct. Yeah. So let's say if you I are in the you, you are in right track, whatever is coming in your body, you can just drag it. Yeah, so if so, what happens is what as of my understanding, this split will give us a array record, right? So from that mm -hmm. array, it, it will come two records one is div and one is chn underscore 56063. So right. if we put if we take the first value out of that array, right, that zero record, it will come as whatever we call as the div, we can give it as a name as div, right? Mm -hmm. Dot alias. So this is the one column we have separated from that one value we have separated from the entire column, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to split it more, right? Now we have to split it based on. Okay, you are you, you have split it and taken consideration of the first row and yeah, the first, first part. First part, yeah. The from first the part is the first part from the array is div. Div, yeah. So you do not have to do anything with div. You have to take in out the middle part, that is chn or hyd. So div, you do not have any work to do with div. But uh, what I believe, Ankur, is like here, as we have uh, we have to take both uh, location as well as id, right? So we have to separate based on that thing also, because otherwise, le let's say I separate. Yeah, that is that is correct. That is yeah. correct. You have to split with if you split with the underscore, I mean the hyphen, yeah. it will give you div and chn underscore 5603. Yeah. Now you have to take out the chn part. So how will you do that? Okay. So let's say I, I split it based on as you are suggesting underscore. Yeah. So if I am taking the first part out of it, it will give me chn underscore, you are saying like that. Oh, understood, understood. By by you mean to say, if I have taken the first part out of this, now I, how will I Correct. further split it? Oh, understood. Correct. Okay, so further again, I will, what I can do is, further I can again apply the split function on this, right? Mm -hmm. And now I am splitting it uh, based on what we can say, underscore, right? Correct. Yeah. I split it based on underscore. And from here, again, we will get the two record, right? Mm -hmm. So first record we can name as location and second record we can name as ID. Yeah, so you have to take only the location. So yes. Okay. But, uh, your location means second record, right? So, sorry, first first record. Record. so that is zero first, record. First record. Yes, yeah. correct. So, so I can alias it as location. I can and now that. you have to create a new column with that location. Okay. So now you mean to say I have to rename no, that is a, that is the second part. This is the okay. second part. Now your first your data frame will have you have, as of now you have just taken out and splitted out that location from okay. the reference ID column. Okay. Now you have to create a column out of that. 
your data frame will have four columns name, reference ID, salary, and location. You have to create a column based on that information. Yes, and that's right. Okay. So we can make use of width column transformation. Or, or otherwise I can do here also, I can select the different columns also, right? Let me do in one query only, Angu. let me try. Then we have Maybe we must do it a bit faster. Yeah, yeah, sure. Name, then we got uh, this is not a, this is a reference ID, okay. And then we got salary and location. Location we got, and from here we can get salary. Okay. So they are added this, yeah. We got all the columns from the employee here, name, salary, and this is the new column with the name location, right? I'm selecting the particular columns based on the output. So now can I proceed to the second part? Like how can we rename this? Okay, you do it. Okay. Now coming to rename as CHN, we have to give it to Chennai, HYD, Hyderabad. Okay. If possible, can I make use of uh, temporary views and write the SQL query? I feel that is more comfortable for me. Okay. So let's say I made some, uh, I, I made some uh, create or replace temp view out of this. Okay. But do you know if you, if, if it has to do with the data frame, what kind of approach you do? Just an idea. You can discuss it. Yeah, like uh, first of all, whatever came into my mind is like if I create the temporary view out of this, in terms of SQL, I'm telling what we can do is we can use the case when statement and we can map it to like when the location name is coming CHN, we can make it Chennai when uh, HYD, we can make it. Okay, write the, write, the, write the case when select state. Yeah, create or let's say create or replace. Let's say I'm creating this temp view and I'm giving it a name as employees. Okay. This is my temp view now. So on top of this, if I want to write the SQL query, okay, spark dot SQL. Let's say, yeah. So select star employees. Yeah, now we have to derive one more column, right? So we can make use of case. But we have to make this as another CT because we have to now then after from that temporary table, we have to derive the new column, right? Because here two columns will come. Here CHN will also come and Chennai will also. Come. So from there, I have to select only one out of those, like Chennai, right? So let, I am assuming this as CT, my temporary table, I'm storing it in. So case. Now, when look, what is the column name? Location, right? Location is equal to is equal to CHN. Then I will give it a name as Chennai. Same, I can repeat for all the fours. Then we have. Uh, Let's say HYD. It's okay. Just yeah. we, we can give it Hyderabad, right? Uh, that is fine. Just do not need to do all the stuff. It's okay. Proceed. Okay. Yeah. So the, what will happen is this will give us a table, and from mm -hmm. there we can let's say we have make a CT out of it, and from there we will remove that, uh, and we have let's say I have given this uh, name as as I, I am renaming this column as uh, let's say. Uh, location new okay 
So from the new that uh, CT we have created, now we have to select all the columns apart from this uh, location and we have to select instead of that location. So in this way, we can able to do by using the SQL kind of. This is fine, but just as a note, please, yeah. you are not reading your location for. No, like in employee DF, I have created the temp view. When there is a location, when in your case statement, in yeah. case statement, location okay. equal to CH and then that is chain line. Yeah. So, and you are creating a new column as location. Right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I wanted to have the, in the same column itself. So in location, uh, in location column itself, the CHN will change to chain line. Okay. So now it's fine. You can copy paste me the solution to chat. I'll, I'll take a look. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Radu, for attending the session. We'll uh, share the signal. Thank you.